Hi, uh, I'm Philip Oliver. And I'm Andrew Oliver. And together we're the Oliver Twins. So uh, how did we get into making games? Um, well, I guess it all came started when we were young. Um, we were 11, 12, um, early 80s, into sci-fi, watching programmes on TV like Buck Rogers. Star Wars. Star Wars in 97, obviously. <laughs> Um, I had Star Wars wallpaper, it was really, really cool. We were, in, we were into that stuff and anything that's new, modern, tech. Yeah, f first kids with digital watch, first kids with sort of electronic sort of space invaders. I was going to say arcades, but if the games were only just being invented. But arcades did exist because they were always uh, pinball machines and fruit machines. Thing. And then the TV ones turned up, which were Space Invaders and uh, Pac-Man, that we absolutely loved, particularly Asteroids. We played a hell of a lot of Asteroids. It's good for two players, Asteroids, because one can be on the hyperspace and one can actually be... Uh, and shooting. Yeah. So well, <laughs> but the other one could stay out. But obviously, <laughs> keep putting your money in and then going out to these places on Saturday afternoons and stuff. It's like, well, the idea of having a computer at home was brilliant. And obviously, the UK in the early 80s saw many home computers because actually, all, all teenage boys, uh, I have to say, because it didn't include many other people, but all teenage boys, that was every Christmas present list, yeah. wish list was I want a home computer, whether it be a VIC-20, an Atari VCS or, or Spectrums yeah. and, and ZX81s. Um, so we desperately wanted one and our parents said that's an awful lot of money because they were typically around £200 which in today's money it's the kind of buying a PlayStation 4 or something, that's the sort of the money and it's like well are you going to use this? Uh, and they looked pretty rudimentary. Um, and you had to have a vision to yeah. actually see that there was some value there. Yeah. So, but but we were convinced that we wanted to sort of play with this, not only to play the games, but we were actually really interested about how it all worked. So, um, we decided that well, we save up our pocket money because Christmas was a long, long way away, and our birthday was near Christmas. And well. we'd al we'd already got the bug because our brother had bought a second-hand ZX81. So we played with it a bit. I mean, yeah. got, it's a bit rubbish, and that's <laughs> I, I think that's the worry. Is like well. This computer is supposedly better, but you'll get bored of that pretty quick as well. It's like, well, we don't think we will, but we'll uh, go and save up our pocket money, and that was never going to work. So we ended up taking a newspaper round to try to get money faster because we were keen as as hell to sort of get hold of a com home computer. And so that was, uh, we managed to get hold of a Dragon 32 as our sort of first colour computer that was ours, and that was September 82. Um, from that newspaper money, we hadn't actually quite collected enough, but um, our parents kind of subbed this, this, the rest of it because we got about halfway. Um, and Everyone else was getting spectrums, by the way, um, around us. All Vic um, 20s. And the Vic 20 seemed to be the popular one. Um, it is a bit obscure and random that we did a Dragon 32, but I have to say, you look at the spectrum, and it was a tiny little keyboard, and then like, oh, typing on that. We wanted something with a proper keyboard um, because we imagined ourselves actually typing. Um, and we'd used ZX81 and trying to do typing listings on a ZX81 was really hard and we were thinking well the Spectrum's not much more and it's quite frustrating but typing the, in. But the Dragon 32 had an awesome keyboard. Yeah and it was boasting proper colour and actually it was quite good. It was quite good but nobody else had one <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they didn't really write many games for it. Yeah well that's actually an advantage the fact that we got hold of a computer that had a good basic, good colour, good keyboard hardly any games that you could buy for it. So we, we ended up going, well, we'll have to kind of make our own entertainment. You, you're gonna spend each evening sitting down. Now, if we'd have had a Spectrum, it would have been difficult to program and use, but very easy to just load up a game. And we would have spent our evenings just playing the games other people made. But on a Dragon, it's like, you buy one or two games and go, oh, that's all. But then you turned on these 8-bit computers and they always threw up a basic and a cursor and you could type sort of 10 print hello world, 20 go to 10. And it would just... And it's like, oh, I'm in control of the computer! And that was actually really exciting. And that's one thing that doesn't exist today, which is a bit of a shame. So you have your smartphone, you have your PC and you can't really kind of take control of it very easily. Well, um, whereas in those days it was like, oh right, well I've done two instructions, now let's do a third line, and a fourth line, and a fifth line. And three or four weeks later, you've got a little Pac-Man going around the screen. And I, I, I mean, the BBC was best for this, but what I was going to say is, the Dragon actually had an interesting feature in the fact that it had some basic drawing commands, so you could just draw lines around the screen. So it was very easy to sort of draw patterns of cobwebs and stuff, which was 
Uh, we all know from Windows backdrops, the screensavers, those sort of things. But it was so simple to do that on a Dragon. And it also had sprite commands. So it was very, very easy to get a, a Pac-Man or a Space Invader just moving around the screen in it's basic. Like. Which, <laughs> which actually was quite difficult on a Commodore 64 or a Spectrum. It's like within the basic, there wasn't the feature to just move characters around the screen. So actually, that was a real big plus that within days, we had things moving around very simply. Uh, so the first um, piece of work we actually had published was a type-in listing in computer and video games called Roadrunner, and that was actually um, for the Dragon 32. Um, we got paid for that, £50, and we used that £50 to buy a BBC Micro because it was clear that this was a much more powerful machine, much easier to use, much easier to learn things on. So actually our next work was all on the BBC, um, and our, our big gig that we won that was sort of a uh, milestone really, was winning a national TV competition, the Saturday show, with a game called Strategy, although when it was released it was renamed to Gambit for Aconsoft. Philip and Andrew Oliver from Trowbridge in Wiltshire, where are they? <laughs> Why did you actually write it and what was the basis for it? Um, well, a lot of people have been trying to write arcade games in BASIC, which are far too slow, and we really thought we couldn't get one sort of a high enough quality so we had to turn to a slow game sort of more family game and we came up with this idea after playing some board games and something i do find funny about that was the fact that we wrote it on a bbc micro which is a tv channel and the other tv channel was the one that did the competition which was itv and so uh, you'll notice on the the footage they said they have a nice computer of their own it's like yeah, they want it, I'd say BBC. One of these okay. guys' prizes anyway, and I know that everybody will be green with envy. They got a nice computer of their own at home, so we said, why don't you choose another prize? And you've decided to go for what's called a high-resolution monitor, whatever that is, for goodness sake. I suppose <laughs> you lot know. <laughs> Sounds like something who collects the rubbers at the end of class. But anyway, a high-resolution monitor, and also the possibility that top manufacturers, Commodore, are going to market your game, and it'll actually appear on the high street. Um, <laughs> we, we just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was one of those sort of fad things. We were teenagers and like all of our teenage friends, our geeky friends anyway, but half of them, um, we were all just all into playing computer games. It's the same as anyone now sort of thing. But we said, oh, we think we can make sort of a career out of doing this. And it was like, well, no, you can't because these things are just a passing fad. And anyway, you don't get much money for them because we had started to get one or two published whilst we were at school. But it wasn't much money. We were getting £100, £250 and stuff like that. You can't exactly get a mortgage on <laughs> these kind of things. Um, but we came to the end of our sixth form with our A-levels and it was all about everyone going off to university, our friends going to university. We did some sort of interviews and offers at university. But there were, weren't games programming courses, and there were some programming courses, and it was about programming databases, and it was Dumb as dishwater. So dull, and we were just like, we're not going to university to do that stuff, that's just so boring. And um, so we, we were just complaining that we didn't want to go to university, uh, when all of our friends and our parents expected us to. Um, but luckily, um, our head teacher or he was head of sixth form who was very very friendly with us and our parents just said to our parents give them a year out because they're very very passionate about this and they've clearly published some games they've just got no money but the challenge was make it a business like can you actually make money from writing games because it was a hobby um, and it was a hobby for most people frankly yeah so um, we had to get serious then because we had one year to prove to our parents that we could make a business otherwise out. we went to university and we didn't want to go <laughs> so um, so we had to look at sort of what was going to sell and we came up with this um, idea we'd, we'd seen that one of the best-selling games at the time was Ghostbusters uh, the game for the movie the, the, the one written by is it David Crane um, for Activision um, and it was bestseller and we thought well if you can pick a, a name that will sell, then that's going to be really popular. But we can't afford to buy movie rights. It's like we don't even know how that works. Um, so we came up with the idea of Robin Hood because we thought, well, nobody owns it. 
but you will recognize it. So if you use the name Robin Hood, everybody kind of knows, hey, that sounds fun. We're going to use bow and arrows, projectile weapons, really good. Yeah. Um, you're, you're in castles. You're in castles. castles you're going to have enemies. There's a hero. So we, we were saying, we, we know it would conjure up a certain gameplay that we can make a really good game of. And we know that anyone hearing or seeing it will go, I know what that game is. Yeah. Um, and so that was our way of getting recognition because there were lots of games which were coming out, like, I don't know, Equinox or something. And you go, well, what, what is it? <laughs> it's like there were loads of uh, Zeviuses and, and like these just made up words and we're going, how does anyone know what they're buying? Um, and the artwork's usually quite poor. Um, so you, you go walk into a shop and you see all these cassettes and I don't know what the name is and I don't, and the artwork looks rubbish. So what am I going to buy? Oh, there's Ghostbusters. So, so we knew, so we knew what Ghostbusters was. And Ghostbusters was an awesome movie, obviously. Um, <laughs> So it's like, well, we've got to be aligned with that. We've got to be more like Ghostbusters and less like these made up things. Um, so we came up with the idea of Super Robin Hood. We went to a trade show in London in the September of 86. Which is when our friends were all just going off to university. We went to a trade show and met the Darling Brothers. Um, they were just setting up, um, well, actually it was digital computers at that point, uh, but they were just setting up, they hadn't found a name, I don't think. Um, but they were just setting up a computer company. Rich and David had written some games for Mastertronics. They'd made reasonable amount of royalties and they now wanted to set up their own company. Publisher. And they were looking for developers uh, to write games. And we just got on really well with them and said, yeah, we can write games. Um, we said that we'd had some published, we, had, we hadn't made any money out of it, <laughs> but we had had some games well, published. Well, I remember we, we sort of had a bag of um, sort of here, here we've had this published, like this CV. published. Yeah, exactly. And um, we've got an idea for a new game, Super Robin Hood brought it out, piece of paper. Um, it was it was little more than two or three pages of paper, but it, it was Super Robin Hood. Um, and we sort of said, so if we wrote this, how much would you pay us? And David Darling said, £10,000. Which we just couldn't believe. It's just like, hang on, hang on. We've always dealt in hundreds. <laughs> it's like ten thousand pounds. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay. okay. Well, I was going to say we didn't sleep. What actually happened was we had one computer and most of the time one was typing, one was writing, drawing, designing, and then you'd take sort of four hour stint sleeps. So it's 20 hours work, four hours sleep, 20 hours work, four hours sleep. And we did that for the whole of the September through the first week of October, finished the game, took it back to them and said, there you go, 10,000 pounds please. And they loaded it up and they had a look they at it and they were like, that's really, really nice. That's a brilliant game and everything. So here's the contract and they bring out the contract and the contract was actually for royalties. Like 10p per cassette. 10p per cassette. And it's like, that's not 10,000 pounds. And then they were very quick to sort of jump in and go, no, 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 but we're going to duplicate um, whatever it was, 20,000 copies or something. And we will sell every single one. So that's 2,000 pounds, absolutely guaranteed. But it depends how many we can sell. And then the that, that's just first duplication run. So if it goes really, really well, well, it could get up to 10,000. A little bit disappointing. But for six weeks' work, we were going to get a minimum of two grand. Yeah. And it was like, well, that's the best offer on the table. Yeah. Frankly. So we'll, so we'll, go, we'll go with that. Um, that's, fine. that's fine for two weeks, uh, four weeks' worth of work. We'll do, we'll do that. And um, they produced the artwork. It was a really nice cover. We were very pleased with that. We were enthusiastic, we went back, started writing another game immediately, that would be Ghost Hunters. The game went out uh, a few weeks later. You could duplicate cassettes so quickly, put them into the shop so quickly, and it went straight to number one. Um, the reviews were absolutely fantastic all in the 90s, and the royalties started coming in, and by the time we got to our first royalty statement in the January, February time, it was close to 10,000, if not 10,000 pounds. Um, so it was all fine. It was all fine, it all worked out. Um, and so we just kept writing, and we'd already set up this principle of sort of working very, very hard, seven days a week, stupid hours. There was a kind of, well... We've got to do it again. We've got to prove that that wasn't just a stroke of luck, that we could actually do it again. Yeah. So we put as much work into sort of ghost hunters, going, we've got to prove that we can do it again. And we did, and people go, okay, that was good. Yeah. But maybe still a, a, a ton of luck. It's like, no, we were on a roll here. And then um, we, we saw, um, we were, I, I think, 17, 18, um, had a bit of a dodgy, rusty old car. And Rich and David, one had an MR2 and one had a Celica. Now we already saw the royalties coming in. And I remember one time pulling up to their offices in our dodgy old car and parking next to their lovely cars, 
going, the amount of money that we could make off a game, we could, could almost buy one of those. Yeah. Let's just make another game. And buy a nice car. And buy a nice car. And actually, the game we actually made was Grand Prix Simulator. So we thought, hey, we could do a game about cars, because um, Richard Darling had just written BMX Simulator for the Commodore 64, which was hugely successful. So we were like, we could do a game like BMX Simulator, only with cars. Uh, be a bit like Super Sprint, we kind of did know about that. But it was really inspired by the BMX Simulator. Um, we could do that, and then we can go and buy a nice car like that. And that was the plan, and then we did it. So, <laughs> a Honda and Tegua. So we, we had the Dragon 32, that made us not in the Spectrum camp and not in the Commodore 64 camp, because at school, all the, bo all the boys, uh, it was never the girls, um, <laughs> all the boys had a computer and you were either a it's, Commodore, it's a Commodore fanboy, it's, 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 or a Spectrum It's always been Sinclair the same, are you, a, are you um, a Sega? Sega or Nintendo, are you a Xbox or PlayStation? It's yeah. always been the same, there's always been Two camps and then a third sort of on the edge or whatever. And yeah, Nintendo was so, a bit so, flopped. So, so the thing is, the, there were the Commodore fanboys and the Sinclair fanboys, and then we went and got a Dragon 32. And it was like, oh, that doesn't make us any. Uh, so we were in the third camp. And then, because there weren't any decent games, we only got bought BBC because we started getting some money. Um, and that put us in that camp. But actually, it was we really, really, really good games. On there, BBC. there was some phenomenal. We bought it because it was such a powerful computer. We loved playing all the games, particularly Acorn Soft games. They were just absolutely amazing. But then we realised that actually, it was difficult to actually make any money on that. It was like, well, there's... And it was difficult to compete, because actually the best of the best programmers were on the BBC. Right, it's really awesome games. And you just like, like, Elite, obviously, um, and Revs. And you're thinking, blimey, you, it's very, very difficult to compete in that market. And the numbers weren't there either, whereas we were going, well, something like that has And we wanted, we wanted our games to be published, we wanted them to be successful, so we'd seen the fact that on the Dragon 32 there weren't many games but it was a good computer, and then Amstrad came along and we are like, oh, there's a good computer, it's got a nice keyboard, if we had to produce our games for that, there aren't many games for it, it could be, it could really go, and actually that's what we did. Um, and it was based on a Z80 chip, um, so you'd write it on the Amstrad, then we realised they weren't selling particularly well, but we liked the quality of, of the games and the ease and we got, to write it. Yeah. It had a disk drive and it had an external compiler. Which and we got great. really good at writing games on it. And <laughs> we'd written our tools, map editors and sprite things and stuff for that machine. But Codemaster said, look, the real money's in the Spectrum. And we thought, well, it's a Z80. We had a look at it and it's like, actually, we came up with a way to write Spectrum games, which were pretty much straight ports, same code in everything. But we wrote them on the Amstrad. We wrote them on the Amstrad and then ported it across. And with a cable, we could actually just link the Amstrad to the Spectrum and so then we just never, spit them down. We never actually typed on a, on a Spectrum. So we actually did manage to avoid that. Even though, you, by this time, you could actually buy the Spectrum Pluses and the ones yeah. with nice keyboards. We never actually did. Um, mm. We just used it as a slave computer programming it via the Amstrad, and it worked really well. Everybody also expected us, because we were sort of best-selling authors on the Spectrum, to actually understand the Spectrum. Well, the keyboard, can I just grab a the keyboard? Uh, I remember going round to somebody's house once, um, and they said, um, sort of, we were the Oliver Twins, best-selling games on the Spectrum, they said, could you tell me how to get this word over here? And it's like, yeah, shift control function. Actually, we don't know. Um, and we were looking at it going, don't know, because we just use ZX up and down and a cable in the back. <laughs> and we don't use any other buttons and we never touch any of the buttons, so we don't know. It's like, and they were like just absolutely staggered. And the funny thing is, I worked out the other day because I'm preparing for, um, some materials for this book that's being written, um, the Oliver Twins book. We actually never owned any Spectrum games. We never purchased anybody else's games, ever. Uh, I've never really thought about that. No, no. Quite. we didn't ever buy any games. Because we didn't use this for playing games on. We had a BBC sitting next to it. Why would you do that? We had a BBC with a disk drive. Um, so we actually only ever used a few buttons yeah. on the Spectrum ourselves, um, and we never played any games on it. Except our own, obviously, while testing. Right, there you go, there's yeah. an interesting fact. I forgot, yeah. yeah and we, we never didn't. owned a Commodore 64, and actually most of the games um, that came out on the Commodore 64 are games, as in the Grand Prix Simulator, Ghost Hunters, Super Robin Hood, we didn't actually play them. Uh, we didn't even see them. This was something that quite often Codemasters would organise. We'd go to a meeting at a Codemasters and they'd show us the game and say, are you okay, okay with that? Sometimes we were, sometimes we wouldn't, but sometimes it's this guy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah. oh, hmm. Yeah, <laughs> there was a couple of ports we didn't think were brilliant, but yeah, but we weren't really that involved with it. The 
there's a couple of games that we actually ported other people's games. Um, there's the Fruit Machine Simulator, which is a very sad story. We, our artist, who was a best friend of the Darlings and grew up with the Darlings, was James Wilson. And he'd actually started doing some loading screens for us. Um, and when we went up to Codemasters, he was always there and doing artwork for other games. And he did the art, artwork for all the Darlings games. Um, and he'd done this design for Fruit Machine Simulator. Mark Baldock had started programming the Spectrum. He may have even finished programming the Spectrum. And unfortunately, um, one evening we were invited to a party, um, late November, it was a pretty horrible night and everything. We actually turned it down because we didn't want to go. Cause they all got blindingly drunk. They it? all got blindingly drunk and unfortunately, yeah, he died um, that night. He fell off the pier. Um, conversation came up about we could actually do this guy's game because he'd shown us a design, we had a copy of the design. And we were like, we could do this guy's game and everything, and sort of basically the royalties will go to the family and stuff. So we were like, yeah, we did that. Yeah, that'd be quite nice. So that was one of the first ones we did. We got approached um, by an agent who'd got the rights to Ghostbusters 2. Now, we were massive fans of Ghostbusters, the film, and we'd seen how successful the first game had been in Ghostbusters, and I'm like, man we could do Ghostbusters 2. So they'd already started writing Commodore 64 version, um, and so they approached us to say, would you like to do the Armstrong and Spectrum version? So, and we'll do, pay you to do it, convert this Commodore 64 version. So we did that. Actually, we did it's do what ISS easy. first. Just before that, he'd approached us with another game, ISS, Incredible mm. Shrinking Sphere, yeah. convert from the 64 to across to that. So whilst we were working on that, he then went off and got the rights to from Activision for doing the Ghostbusters 2. So that was awesome to work we on. We generally kept these things quiet because like we were working for Codemasters and there were lots of games coming through Codemasters, but when sort of somebody comes through from Activision saying, Can you write a game? It was like, well we'll do it, we'll just keep quiet about it. But that is a kind of a funny thing because we would always go to Codemasters and people go, How the hell do you manage to write game like so, so many, many games in so many formats? It's like, you know, doing some other stuff as well. <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> and actually, for many years, the Incredible Shrinking Sphere, nobody even knew was us because we didn't put our names on it. Um, because we actually had figured it would offend the darlings. Um, there was no agreement to not write games for anybody else, but we thought they might get upset. And they were our mates, and they were doing a great job for us publishing. So we just thought, well, we'll do these other games, but we won't tell anybody. But Ghostbusters 2, we did have to put our names on we that did, one. Yeah, we wanted to take credit for that. Yeah. yeah. It was quite a lot of work. So when Activision or anybody would get the rights to an arcade machine, they'd go, well go and find the arcade machine. Go and copy it. Go and look at it. So, so there was no, so people used to suck ROMs and stuff like that to yeah. grab the graphics out of them and stuff like that. But generally, some lawyers at the top of these companies, Activision to Konami or something, would basically agree a deal. But the programmers wouldn't talk to each other, the designers wouldn't talk to each other. It's like, well, you know where the machine is. It's like, go and go and go and have a look, go and copy it. So absolutely that's what happened. Um, yeah. When it comes to films and licenses, um, we were shocked, but... Ghostbusters 2 is like, we were showing the Commodore 64 version in development and saying, make a copy. And it's like, well, what have you got from the film company? It's like, well, we've got a script. And it's like a typed script of who says what. And it's like, so you can get a vague sort of what the flow of the story is, yeah. but you don't know what it looks like. Um, I mean, it helped, it was number two. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you look at the first Ghostbusters and you go, well, I know what the main characters look like, so that's good. I can kind of guess how they do their ghosts. I can kind of guess the architectural yeah, style so of the buildings. That was, a, that was a massive help, but the idea that you're in any way involved is just... No. You, yeah, you're not. You, you see as much as the people making the lunchboxes. And to be... Because it always came from the marketing division. The, the it was licensed. And to be perfectly honest, we've done many, many games since of films. It's always the way. It's always this, the way. Yeah. It's like the number of times, and I won't go into some of the stories, but very big movies that we've done games for, we've not seen any footage of, of movies or anything. We pretty much get scripts. You're lucky if you get a few photos or screenshots or something. And we've made horrendous mistakes of games which are supposed to follow the movie, and everyone has seen the movie, but it's the one thing we didn't. Yeah, we never saw So, so it's quite interesting. I mean, um, he said he won't go into all the stories, but obviously we've done lots of movie games over the years. But a classic example is um, Mummy Returns. So it's Mummy 2. It was always known as Mummy 2. At least, again, there was a Mummy 1 film. So, so, we, so we had some ref reference. We had points. reference of we, Mummy 1. We had a script, um, we had no visuals. 
We went along to America to the E, uh, what would you call it, E3 show. Our game, Mummy Returns, was on the screen to be reviewed. And that night was the premiere of the film in America. So we were invited. So the game's already been on the stand. And finished. And finished. And that night, we were allowed to go and see the movie. If your offering is accepted, the gods will bless and make a gift to you in return. So the game was finished, mastered, on the stand, in front of journalists before we ever saw the movie. So we actually went to the movie going, I wonder what this movie is about that we've kind of mastered and finished the game for. It's, it's, some it's some bits tie up really nicely. Some bits Flip. you look at the game and you go look at the movie and go, I'm not quite sure why they did it like that. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Dizzy. Now that's the sort of interesting one that obviously everyone knows us for. Um, and there were starting to be platform games. Uh, there had been Chucky Egg, Manic Miner, a couple of others. Panic. Um, and we, we, that's we played BBC games like Frack um, and stuff like that. Yeah, which but really we, so we'd obviously done Super Robin Hood um, and Ghost Hunters. And so this be, was kind of the third in the series, really. Th I mean, this Robin yeah. Hood, Ghost Hunters, yeah. so and now we're different characters. It was becoming a genre. Platform games was one of the genres, and we thought, well, um, we could we could do that, but one of the things that we noticed is, and it's probably mostly from playing Frack on the BBC, is and actually Manic Miner. God, they're so hard. It was just like, and we were saying, well, how come? Like, because game players are fairly casual and, and they just want to get through the levels. Why are they sort of jump pixel perfect on every jump? Um, and we've done it a bit, um, and we just thought, well, we want to make a game that you don't have to do a platform game that's not pixel perfect jumping and it's going to kill you every few minutes. But then people said, but, but where's the game? And we said, well, the game is trying to adventure and, and work out where to go next. And we've done a bit of this in, in Robin Hood, um, of sort of opening doors with the right key. Yeah, everybody kind of assumed that gameplay meant challenge. Get the two were, this, were linked together. And actually that was, and that's what was the common accepted practice. And we were saying, well, why uh, can't And then challenge being um, Twitch. Dex dexterity. Dexterity yeah. and Twitch buttons. Get yeah. Uh, otherwise it's not a game. Whereas we were thinking, you know, gameplay is kind of more than that. And, and adventuring is fun. We're working out what's on the next screen and trying to solve this puzzle. Because we loved some of the text-based adventures. The Zork from the, from the Apple IIe. And then we had um, a bunch of Acorn Soft Adventure games on the BBC. And these had gameplay, but it wasn't about Twitch, it was about trying to solve the puzzles and solve all the so problems. We were trying to sort of make adventure games into graphics. Yeah. Um, and um, I believe Hobbit and things like that had been on the spectrum, but we didn't have those games, so we didn't know. Yeah. But later people go, oh, it's a bit like, and it's like, yeah, well, we didn't have those games, so <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the thing about Dizzy is it's a, the ultimate cartoon adventure. We love cartoons. We, we're not artists, as uh, probably some of our graphics shows, because we do a lot of our graphics, but. Thankfully, the computers are so poor we got away with it. Um, but we we loved animation and, and cartoons, and the idea of people bringing non-real things to life. Because there were two types of TV and films that we grew up with: the ones where you stick a camera looking at something, or something fantasy, which had to be drawn. And we just loved the total fantasy of cartoons. And it's like, well, we wanted to make fantasy world. Um, <laughs> so therefore, um, I don't know why it took so long to call the third one fantasy world. <laughs> we said, let's make some made up fantasy world that, that looks as good as a cartoon. It was, it was our goal. This is an unexpected success, but we didn't know it was a success. Now that, <laughs> and that is really weird because the games that we'd written before had gone to number one in the charts. So we had um, written Super Robin Hood and Ghost Hunters. And, and Grand Prix Simulator. And Grand Prix Simulator. They'd all gone to number one in the charts. Dizzy didn't. Okay. So to us, it was a flop. Um, <laughs> so yeah, unexpected success. Yeah, it was a flop. Um, we got some nice reviews, but, but when it actually came to sales, uh, we were really disappointed by the artwork on the cover. And when we, when we were out and about, not that we got out that much, a lot of people talked about Dizzy. When we did meet people, it was like, it was Dizzy. And they didn't talk about Grand Prix Simulator and, and things, which was kind of interesting. And then... Activision did. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> then, then there was a very curious uh, point in the fact that um, uh, fan mail started turning up at Codemasters, and this was the really weird thing: is letters were turning up, and the secretaries of Codemasters would bring things. Like we'd occasionally go up to Codemasters. We lived a fair distance. A two-hour drive. Yeah, so we lived a fair distance, but we'd turn up, and it was like there was a sort of a load of mail for us, and it got to a point where there was literally a sack one time. But they gave us a sack of letters. So they're for you. And we're, what are we supposed to do with this? And you open the letters, and they're all dizzy. Pretty much. Dear Oliver Twins, I absolutely love your games. I've been playing your games, blah, blah, blah. But I've been playing your latest game, Dizzy, and I am stuck on. And then it would always vary. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was really sweet. It was, they're all handwritten, because this was d days before computers and typewriters and stuff, and they were all handwritten. They were all Not written. before typewriters. No. But they, <laughs> yes, but they were all from kids, and yeah. the kids weren't using the typewriters. So they were always handwritten. And you just thought, this is amazing. And it was so sweet. And we'd never had this before. Um, so we started right, right, like, re replying to the first few, but it's actually taking quite yeah. a long time. Yeah. It does take a long time to type a letter. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, I mean, we obviously start, just start typing the same thing, but you realise you have to actually answer the question, which was always diff different. But then I think we diligently spent a week saying, Let, let's get through this. Um, nowadays we have that at work, we try to get through CVs sometimes. Um, and you think, no, let's just knuckle down. And I think we spent like most part of a week like writing through and feeling really chuffed that we'd answered all these letters and gone, oh, but we're not moving forward and actually... Like, we're not doing another game because of this. We're not doing another <laughs> game and like, what happens if this just continues? And it did continue. Yeah. So then what we did is we spent some time and we wrote we up... We did a script. The, the full solution. The full solution and then what we did is just started posting back um, full solutions to people. Well so actually we gave them to the secretary. Yeah, we gave to the secretary to post back. said, just, just write, thank you, the very sweet or whatever, here's a full solution. So but then we're thinking, that's not a very good solution because they were only stuck on one bit, but you gave it to them all. You, you've given them the entire game. Which is a bit of a shame because now they're not going to be challenged on the rest of it. So yeah, they're just playing it doesn't work like very well. And also, Codemaster said that um, they were only making 40 or 50p per cassette. So every kid that writes in, they pretty they've much, lost their money. They've lost their profit. So we came up with this idea that if we um, recorded it on a on a cassette, and then we put it on a telephone line. Then people could ring in. They'll find. They'll hear the solution, and then they'll, they'll get. The phone as, down. They'll get as far as they need to to hear what it is they they got stuck on, and then they'll put the phone down. And we thought, well, that's quite a good solution. And then completely by accident. Um, the only service, telephone service, that existed at the time to do that was called the 0898, the 0898 service. Premium, premium phone calls. Premium phone calls. And we didn't intend it to actually happen that way. No. We just tried to solve a problem, but actually it ended up making quite a lot of money. Yeah, because actually people <laughs> had to pay <laughs> for that phone way. call. Um, so Codemaster started pr heavily promoting it. We uh, agreed royalties with Codemasters for these telephone lines, and actually, all the Dizzy games from Fantasy World onwards, we actually made more money off the phone lines than we made off selling cassettes and selling the games. The, so times change. Um, we were very, very successful, first of all, on the Amstrad, and then we were able to get the um, Spectrum in. And, and the other ports were done. And the then end. other people would do ports to the Commodore 64. Then people started porting to the ST and the Amiga, so Fast Food and Treasure Island, Dizzy and that. They started appearing on the ST and Amiga, no, and we were looking at these programmers' games and meeting some of these they, they were very, very good and very clever. Yeah. I mean, very good artists on the ST and Amiga, and some and very we good programmers around us. Um, but the one thing that scared us on the ST and Amiga is the fact that, I mean, yes, it was a new language and it was loads of memory and stuff like that, which kind of like, oh, it's going to be quite a development thing. But it was like, every one that we knew, they said, oh, come around, oh, look at this rack of games I've got, because it had all gone to discs and there was just piracy rife. And it's like, and every time I saw an ST and, and then the Amiga, people would always just go, oh, I've got racks of games. How many games do you want? It's like, how many have you actually bought? And it was the first time that piracy had ever hit us. We'd always been aware that on the spectrum, people had occasionally copied a tape to a tape, but it was always a bit rubbish, and it would still be 50-50 whether it loaded. Um, and and I get, our games were being sold for one, one pound 99, two pounds 99. And it would cost you a bit to buy a new blank set. So, so people weren't bothering that much. 
much. And if they were bothering, well, you haven't really lost a sale to those people because they didn't have yeah. any money. So the ST and Amiga were there, and all we could see is all fanboys loved it, and they loved it because they didn't need to buy games. And yet these games were being made from Cygnosis and these other companies, and we're just going, oh my god, it's just a mess. So we were having this, like, we've got to jump off the spectrum because it's obviously the old tech. And we loved that, we wanted to move forward. This was about 1990, I guess. We wanted to move forward. And, we and then we went to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, in Las, uh, Vegas. Las Vegas. And my God, it was like, just go to Vegas or America or anything. It was just like... It's an eye-opening experience. It's like, but we went there, and I think it was into a couple of years worth of Nintendo games had been out, and it was a big push into America. And we well, just, this was 89.90. We just looked at the size of the market and the fact that these cartridges, you just pushed them in and they played. And we looked at the sort of Mario's and stuff and thought, we could like those. Yeah. So, uh, so I, just, just to sort of... Zero privacy. To, to, to show you where we were at that time, we were in our bedrooms writing. You occasionally go out, you occasionally meet one or two journalists in a room. You very, very occasionally met somebody that played your games because we didn't really get out much. Um, we went into the shops and you could see our games on the shelves and you could see maybe the charts printed. So it's like, oh yeah, the sales are there. We get royalty statements done. But, they but, you've never, but you've never actually met your audience. You've never seen how big it is or whatever. You see a royalty statement and go, that's quite good. Quite a lot of people must be buying this. We went to CES and you walk into this hall, which is the size of Wembley Stadium. And everybody there is playing and buying games. And it's just vast. And you're just going, oh my goodness. And then you look at the games and you go, yeah, could do that. Could do that. And you go, so, the, so, this, so this Mario thing, which is the first time we'd ever seen Mario, we'd probably heard of it. First, we saw this and we're like, so this one here, um, what's that all about? And, and it was, um, uh, I think it was $30 you had to pay for it. And they were up to about 20 million sales. And we're like, that'll take us about a month to write. It's like, and actually, we could do the art where we can do the programming. It's eight bit. That would be pretty easy. And so that then it was just an epiphany of like I mean, we we need to be doing NES games. Yeah. So uh, there was an interesting thing um, about the NES in the fact that it changed things completely. Consoles coming in was a completely different model. Um, up to that point, there were hardware manufacturers making computers. And software manufacturers wrote the software they, they wanted and they just did what they liked. Whereas a Nintendo and subsequent consoles have changed, like, yeah. uh, have changed the entire model to saying, we're going to produce a machine that's really, really cheap. You can make powerful. software for it, but you license and, and then sort of... Well, back in those days, you had to... People, you had to get you, to manufacture you, Yeah, you could only put a game out onto a console via Sega or via Nintendo. Well, it was a cartridge. And so fact, they produced... They, yeah. they and in fact, cartridges. the contract was you only pick one or other. If you have a deal with Sega, you don't have a deal with Nintendo. If you have a deal with Nintendo, you don't have a deal with Sega. Yeah. Um, and for three or four years, that's the way it was. So EA was aligned with Sega, um, and several other companies were aligned with Nintendo. Um, that's the way it was. Codemasters decided that they didn't like that, they were a publisher, and they they challenged that and actually said, no, we want to produce these Nintendo uh, console cartridges and we don't want to go by Nintendo. And that landed them in some hot water with Nintendo um, and in fact with Sega because they then started producing Sega games the same. Um, but they got through that and um, proved that actually as a third party publisher, you legally were allowed to produce these cartridges. And in fact, that did change the whole global industry so that the likes of your EA and Activision and everybody else now can produce games on whatever consoles they want. Wonderland Dizzy was the sort of final game that we wrote that sort of never got published because things got too difficult. Um, and it was a stressful time, I mean, because the Codemasters were uh, up, in our, uh, up to their necks in sort of legal actions, we had uh, offices and staff. Oh, we'd we started to employ some people at this We point. weren't being paid and our money was just disappearing. Uh, we needed to find new people but, to give but, us contracts. But we had a reputation. Um, we had a very good reputation and we knew that there were people like Activision who would, would give us games. Um, and so we ended up um, talking to an agent because in, in those days, uh, 
just like um, actors and footballers and stuff have agents, we talked to an agent called Jackie Lyons who was representing a few sort of very good programmers like David Braben um, and she said, look, I could find you work. If you want to just, because you want to get out of the Codemaster thing, I'll find you work. And yeah. it was like, okay. So, and, and as a result, we'd actually completely forgotten that we'd written The Wonderland Dizzy. Um, it was only recently when, when we kind of, we discovered the map <laughs> in my loft going, Wonderland Dizzy, what happened to that? What happened to that? It's like, did we ever do that? Did we ever finish that? And then um, it uh, sort of, we were on stage at Blackpool just discussing the fact, did that actually happen? Uh, sorry, did we finish this game? Um, it kind of looks like it finished, well, like we finished it. So we, uh, we were discussing it just after we stepped off stage, going, well, if we finished it, then it's in my loft somewhere. Because one of the things we worked out was, once we'd published Robin Hood, and we'd got to number one, and we'd got 10,000 pounds of royalties, we thought, we're kind of famous, and, and 10 years time, 20 years time, we're gonna look back on this and go, wow, that was awesome. So let's not throw anything well, away. No, but the, the other, so we don't throw yeah, anything but away. The other thing is, some conversions had happened, and when you yeah. do meet a programmer and he's writing a Commodore 64 version of your Spectrum, the first question... You want to give more code. Uh, says, the well, where's your code, where's your graphics, where's your yeah. maps? Actually, we were very good at sending so, people so we, our stuff to convert. Yeah, we did, actually. Uh, so, we, so we never got it from other people, but we always gave it back. Yeah. Actually, if we're, if we're missing stuff, it's only because somebody didn't return it. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually true. So we thought, well, therefore, the um, if this exists, then somewhere in my loft, but bearing in mind that this was kind of 25 years later, or 22 years later, somewhere in my loft will be all the supporting um, artwork and discs and maybe even some ROM, ROM codes and stuff. And we did, we found it all. Um, so I went up there and hunted around, and after two or three hours of hunting through old boxes, I managed to find the original what, the final source code disc. So after the, the Codemasters kind of separation happened, um, we obviously wanted to write games. That's, that's all we knew and that's all we wanted to do. We just needed to find some new publishers. So uh, we met up with Jackie Lyons, uh, an agent in London, uh, who represented people like Eurocom and Argonaut and uh, David Braben and Ian Bird, who did Elite. Um, she Ian managed Bell. Ian Bell, sorry, uh, and he managed. Uh, she managed to get uh, several contracts um, with Argonaut, um, Domark. with Domark. You wrote the uh, Marco's Magic Football. Um, we yeah, then managed um, Bullfog because I wrote Theme Park and Syndicate on the Mega Drives. That's true. We did make a lot of money in those early days, but it was just the two of us in our home. Yeah. When you when you take well, once we went to console we started to employ artists and then and we got an office and then we got an office heads. and you suddenly have an awful lot of commitments and you, you, you see the And you burn through the cash very, very quickly. So um, we, we just needed reliable work. Yeah. So um, so we did that for six months. Um, uh, we were very, very keen on the PlayStation. So we were we started doing sixty eight thousand and the Mega Drive and Genesis. Um, but um, Sony had approached us and told us about their new machine that they were doing. Um, we actually thought it was really, really cool, the idea of a, a, a computer with 3D graphics. Um, and a CD. And Woo! a CD-ROM. We'd written games on CD. So, we were, well, so, we were so the first games on CD. And we didn't have an affinity or an alignment with Nintendo or Sega, because we'd been the co-masters. So um, when we'd been approached from Sony or Cygnosis, I think it was at the time. And Cygnosis. Um, about the PlayStation, um, we, we ma managed to talk them into giving us um, a dev kit, which was brilliant. Um, I think Jack Jackie Lyons obviously helped with that. And we were just thinking, this, this machine's absolutely awesome. So we basically started developing games on the PlayStation. This was, and they, they, we got the dev kit a year before it came out. Um, and it was amazing because we, now that we were with an agent and she was setting us up with meetings, we were going and meeting people and saying, oh, we're writing on this new PlayStation from Sony. And we were just gobsmacked by how many people just said, never work, absolutely never work. Sony responsible for Sony, Betamax. Sony, uh, yeah, they just did Betamax. That is a complete failure. Um, and how can they possibly touch um, Nintendo and Sega? And we were going, the machine is awesome. 
Like, yeah. so, so come and have a look at the game we've written, the, like some of our demos and stuff. Yeah, and the demos that, that Sony sent out. I mean, Sony, Sony's main demo that they showed everyone was a dinosaur, a 3D dinosaur walking around. And this was when Jurassic Park was in the um, cinemas. Uh, and they had this 3D dinosaur and it was like, we're going, this is in a different league. Yeah. So, so, we, so, so we decided with sort of our eight or so employees to basically back the PlayStation. 100%. 100%. We went into lots of meetings with lots of publishers and unfortunately most publishers were saying, not interested, not interested in PlayStation. It will, Sony will be, they'll do another Vita Max with this. But we just kept plowing on, kept plowing on. Uh, Ridge Racer came out uh, sort of day one um, and it lit up the world and it went ballistic the playstations they couldn't make them fast enough and we were like almost the only de devs that had been going on banging on about this thing and obviously Psygnosis. Um but so few developers has actually even looked at the playstation yet we were already up to speed we were already producing games we produced creature shock um, on it a conversion from the mega mega cd and the pc um, we had this game fire on claude um, that we were in the process of developing. We managed to sign that one with BMG, who were just coming into the market. But then what happened, the PlayStation was so successful and it was CDs, that all the movie studios turned to it. And suddenly there was a Fox Interactive, a Disney Interactive, uh, Universal Interactive, all of them basically. Universal, they all set up interactive divisions because suddenly they go, massive mass market machine with a very strong brand of Sony behind it, and we can bang out CDs, which is kind of a pence. It's like well, they're, they're so much faster to produce, so much easier to store and ship around the world, so much easier to reorder. In fact, that, that's actually so where everyone I, loved the market, and the, and the yeah. PlayStation just we reignited everything. We reignited everything, um, and then so all these um, in new interactive film divisions and toy. Companies, because oh, obviously Hasbro. we got a lot of uh, work through Hasbro. Um, yeah, they all suddenly um, wanted developers who could develop games, and we were like, "There you go, we develop games." But then, of course, PlayStation Two came along. Massive new challenges. Everything changed. Um, it was a little bit tricky for us to sort of get over that hurdle of uh, kind of ramping up, especially as we'd been seen as Blitz of doing family games. Um, so we needed to sort of change our image a little bit and sort of do some sort of uh, more hardcore games, more adult games. Um, so things like Mummy Returns we did and a few other games like that. And then the game, then after a slight slump, started to take off again. And by about 2010, we were up to well over 200 people, um, and that we, took us into the PlayStation we, 3 era. So we ended up falling into this um, taking a brand into a video game. But to be perfectly honest, we actually really liked it. When you're controlling teams of people, if you have a team of 10 creative people in front of you and you say make an original game, it's just infighting and battling. Whereas if somebody brings like Disney bring you this sort of new concept for a film, you go over to Florida, I'm thinking Lilo and Stitch in this case, um, <laughs> a few of you go over to Florida, you have a great time, you meet some creatives. Don't they show to, you some storyboards. They show you some storyboards. You're not allowed to leave with anything. Yeah. <laughs> you, you go back, you've got one year to write a game. We, we found it, it was quite, well financed. Yeah, um, we, we found it all quite exciting. And you everyone knew, loved you knew it. your game was going to come out. One of the issues from from sort of the 95 for the next 15 we years. Knew loads of developers anybody who would do an original games. game, it was just actually getting them out and published was actually really, really difficult because the actual distribution and the marketing was so expensive that people would finish games and then it not be worth the publisher to actually duplicate it and manufacture it and put it out. Whereas when it was Lilo and Stitch, well, of course it's going out. When it's a movie or a game tie in, of course it's going but out. You, and you can creatively control a team to write a nice game going, you've got one year, it's the movie, we'll try and get as much resources as we can, but everyone knows the exact target. And, yeah. and we all enjoyed making lots and lots of games of movies. We're always frustrated that they were never quite as good as they should have been because yeah, for, there were just so many constraints and so many things that, that worked against us. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, uh, got up to Blitz got up to over 200 people. I think it was 235 at its um, height. But then everything changed because the market changed because everything went digital. Now digital changes the equation so much. You'd obviously had teams getting bigger and bigger and bigger and dev times getting longer because if you've got a Call of Duty in a box on a shelf 
and that that um, box cost thirty pounds, and you've got something that the dev team was a quarter of the size and a quarter of the budget, but less it's also that. going to sell for thirty pounds. Yeah, it was less than that. Then, as a consumer, what are you going to buy? Well, of course, you're going to buy the Call of Duty every time. So, what actually happened was there was no middle market. There was no sort of reasonable budget um, games. There were and, and low budget. It was never worth distributing. So, low budget, there was none of. Then there was the medium, which we'd kind of service that market. Um, they are started to disappear as everybody just started focusing in on the big blockbusters and the really expensive high budget ones. But then digital distribution came along, which meant that actually, if you make something that's quite small on a low budget, you don't have to sell many copies and there's no distribution issues. So that works. Middle market kind of works. Top market works. But what doesn't work is a brand coming along like a Disney or a Hasbro or something saying, well, we've got a kind of middle market license, so like a SpongeBob or something like this. For consoles. For for consoles, it's like, well, where's where does that fit into this? So equation? that market disappeared, and our, one of our main publishers was THQ. Um, probably half the games um, that we did over the years was THQ, and they went bankrupt because that market disappeared, and we were like, oh, gosh, writing's on the wall. Now we still could go a little bit further with with Disney and people. They sort of stayed in there, but it's like we knew that. The writings on the wall. So, so, sort of so we had to try and change our business. Um, a lot of people were saying that our business should change to mobile, but everybody wants games back in those days for sixty nine p one dollar. One dollar. Yeah. Everybody wanted games for one dollar, and it's like, and that was tough then to see how the economics would work out. But of course, very quickly it went to everything. Wants everybody wants everything for free. And when you've got two hundred odd people, <laughs> start and to say their salaries. The overheads are phenomenal. And so that wasn't going to work. That was never like, going to work. So we're going to write games that we can charge a dollar yeah. for. It's so we decided to sort of go the other direction and look at the likes of your World of Warcraft and things like that, and say, well, what if we applied all of our people to creating a massively multiplayer online game? We can't be undercut by the little guys. Digital distribution is awesome. We've got all the technology, all the skills, all the resources and everything. We could do this. So we were actually starting to align ourselves in that way. And saying this is where we see the market. It's a, yeah. a ba very big server based free to play game that we serve globally. Um, and unfortunately, we had a bunch of clients who then stopped paying us because we were still doing uh, console games which were in boxes. So, but and they just stopped, they stopped paying us. And, and so unfortunately... It's very sad, blitz. but I mean, we literally had no money. So if you can't pay people, that's it. Yeah, it's, but, yeah. it's as simple as that. Um, Morally, it's the right thing to do, but legally, it's also the, the thing you have to do. Um, if you can't pay people, you can't carry on. So that's when, um, obviously, everything crashed and burned at Blitz, and it was a very, very sad time, and we were quite scared of, well, what are we going to do What's now? The future? Um, but one of our clients, um, Smilegate, we just started working with them. We were working on. Um, we just started talking to them you know, on, yeah. on Sky Saga, um, and basically um, Richard Smithies, who was then taking over our sort of business development um, at Blitz, um, had a great relationship with them, and actually he managed sort of behind the scenes to talk to them and say, well, what if we set up a new company? What if we could get some really good talent and everything? Um, then would you back us? Could could we do this game for you? And that's how we started Radiant Worlds. Um, so we founded Radiant Worlds, uh, Rich and Andrew and I, um, and we approached um, a lot of the good programmers and artists and developers. The, the newer, so we the newer from Blitz that we just made redundant. But, but, I mean, <laughs> um, everyone understood why it happened. I mean, yeah. Uh, so, so most of them, I, we made fifty job offers and forty nine people accepted because they understood what why it happened. It wasn't us trying to shaft them or anything. We meant well. We had to do it. We had no choice. But now we've got this new opportunity, um, funded by Smilegate. It's very creative and you guys as a team can work together and we can make this work and we can make it happen and that's Sky Saga and it's going phenomenal well wow. yeah super chuffed and everyone is um, yeah just doing a brilliant job Sky Saga is obviously our current but actually now that we're digitally distributed now that we've got a community now games that it's all evolve. online and the game's evolving you could say well we could we could run this for five years we could run this for ten years but actually 
why, where would it stop? Why would it stop? Because if we can always improve the client side by just sending down updates, and we can always improve the server side, then what have we fundamentally we've got? We've got a community that's growing, the community are adding the user-generated content and they're adding their own creativity to it. We've, we're, we're living in a fantasy world. We've created this fantasy world, so which is always going to be popular. We can, we can always bring in so new therefore story we can, elements, yeah. new features, new things. I've often thought sort of like, sort of what would be the ideal game. And I think we've ended up sort of in, in a very good position where you can just keep growing this and growing this. And if people come along later, it will just be more impressive. But it's a fantasy world where we can make up what we want, sort of thing. So I don't see that if in 10 years' time we're going to be going, ah, we've kind of run this idea out. No, we haven't. We're going to be there we've going, got, let's got, just keep going, let's just keep we've going. Got so many ideas. So we don't actually see a day that Sky Saga will ever end. Um, we just see it growing and growing and growing. And the interesting thing is that um, it would be very difficult for another developer to come along in five years' time or 10 years' time and go, I'm going to compete with Sky Saga. Good luck, guys. <laughs> I think we got a bit of a lead on you there.